Section 5 of Comic Tragedies by Louisa May Alcott. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Section 5 The Greek Slave. Characters Constantine, Prince Betrothed to Irene. Read by John Steigerwald. Queen Zelneth, his mother. Read by Amy Graymore. Irene, the Greek princess. Ione, the Greek slave. Read by Elizabeth Clatt. Helen, a priest. Read by David Lawrence. Rienzi, a traitor. Read by Max Schollingen. Scene first. Apartment in the palace of Irene. Irene, reclining upon a divan. How strange a fate is mine! Young, fair, and high-born, I may not choose on whom I will bestow my love. Betrothed to a prince whom I have never seen, compelled to honour and obey one whom my heart perchance can never love. Alas! Alas! And yet they tell me that Constantine is noble, brave, and good. What more can I desire? Ah, if he do but love me, I shall be content. Noise without. She rises. Hark! "'Tis his messenger approaching with letters from the Queen, his mother. I will question this ambassador, and learn yet more of this young prince, my future husband." Seats herself with dignity. Enter Rienzi. Kneels, presenting a letter. "'The Queen, my mistress, sends thee greeting, lady, in this scroll. May it please thee read. I wait your pleasure." Irene takes the letter and reads. "'My lord, with a woman's curiosity I fain would ask thee of thy prince, whose fate the gods have linked with mine. Tell me, is he tender, true, and noble? Answer truly, I do command thee. Lady, he is tender as a woman, gentle as thy heart could wish, just and brave as a king should ever be. The proudest lady in all Greece were well matched with our noble Constantine. And is he fair to look upon? Paint me his likeness, if thou canst. I can but ill perform that office. Thou must see if thou wouldst rightly know him. The gods have blessed him with a fair and stately form, a noble face, dark locks, and a king-like brow that well befits the crown that rests upon it. This is he, our brave young prince, one to honour, lady, one to trust and love. Oh, tis a noble man thou hast painted. One more question, and thou mayst retire. Hath he ever spoken of her who is to be his wife? Oh, nay, why do I fear to ask thee? Does he love her? Lady, I beg thee, ask me not. Who could fail to love when once he had looked upon thee? Thou canst not thus deceive me. Answer truly. What doth he think of this betrothal and approaching marriage? He hath not seen thee, princess, knows of thee nothing save that thou art beautiful, and one day to become his wife. But he is young, and hath no wish to wed, and even his mother's prayers have failed to win his free consent to this most cherished plan, that, by uniting thy fair kingdom unto his, he can gain power over other lands, and beautify our own. Perchance his heart is given to another. Has no fair Grecian maiden won the love he cannot offer me? Nay, lady, he loves not but his mother, his subjects, and his native land. But soon, we trust, when thou art by his side, a deeper love will wake within him, and thou wilt be dearer than country, home, or friends. Tis well. Thou mayst retire. I will send answer by thee to thy queen, and seek some gift that may be worthy her acceptance. And now adieu. Rienzi bows and retires. He does not love me, then, and I must wed a cold and careless lord. And yet— so tender to all others, he could not be unkind to me alone. Oh, that I could win his love unknown, and then when truly mine, to cast away the mask and be myself again. Stay, let me think. Ah, yes, I see a way. Surely the gods have sent the thought. I will disguise me as a slave, and as a gift sent to his mother, I can see and learn to know him well. I will return with the ambassador, Rienzi. I spake to him of a gift. He little thinks in the veiled slave he shall bear away the princess is concealed. Yes, Constantine, 
as a nameless girl will Irene win thy heart, and when as a wife she stands beside thee, thou shalt love her for herself alone. Tableau. Curtain. Scene second. A room in the palace of the queen. The queen alone. Why comes he not? They told me that our ambassador to the princess Irene had returned and bore a gift for me. Would that it were a picture of herself? They say she is wondrous fair. And could my wayward son but gaze upon her, his heart might yet be won. Enter Irene, disguised as the slave Ione. Ah, a stranger, who art thou? Ione kneels and presents a letter. Queen reads the letter. Ah, welcome. Thy mistress tells me she hath chosen from among her train the fairest and most faithful of her slaves as a gift for me. With thanks do I accept thee. Lift thy veil, child, that I may see how our maidens do compare with thee. Ione lifts her veil. The queen gazes in surprise at her beauty. Thou art too beautiful to be a slave. What is thy name? Ione, may it please thee, lady. Tis a fit name for one so fair. And thy country, maiden? With the princess, my kind mistress, have I dwelt for many happy years, and honoured by her choice now offer my poor services to thee. What canst thou do, Ione? Thou art too fair and delicate to bear the heavy water-urn or gather fruit. I can weave garlands, lady, touch the harp and sing sweet songs, can bear thee wine and tend thy flowers. I can be true and faithful, and no task will be too hard for thy grateful slave, Ione. Thou shalt find a happy home with me, and never grieve for thy kind mistress. And now listen while I tell thee what thy hardest task shall be. I will confide in thee, Ione, for thou art no common slave, but a true and gentle woman whom I can trust and love. Thou hast heard thy lady's betrothed to my most noble son, and yet I grieve to say he loves her not. Nay, in the struggle against his heart hath lost all gaiety and strength, and even the name Irene will chase the smile away. He loves no other, yet will not offer her his hand when the heart that should go with it feels no love for her who is to be his wife. I honour this most noble feeling, yet could he know the beauty and the worth of thy fair lady, he yet might love. Thou shalt tell him this, all the kind deeds she hath done, the gentle words she hath spoken, all her loveliness and truth thou shalt repeat. Sing thou the song she loved, weave round his cups the flowers she wears, and strive most steadfastly to gain a place within his heart for love and Lady Irene. Canst thou, wilt thou do this, Ione? Dear lady, all that my poor skill can do shall yet be tried. I will not rest till he shall love my mistress as she longs to be beloved. If thou canst win my son to health and happiness again, thou shalt be for ever my most loved, most trusted friend. The gods bless thee, child, and give thy work success. Now rest thee here. I will come ere long to lead thee to the prince. Exit the queen. All goes well. And what an easy task is mine, to minister to him whom I already love, to sing to him, to weave garlands for his brow, and tell him of the thoughts stirring within my heart. Yes, I most truly long to see him, whom all love and honour. The gods be with me, and my task will soon be done. Curtain. Scene third. Another room in the palace. Constantine, sad and alone. Another day is well nigh past, and nearer draws the fate I dread. Why must I give up the bright dreams of my youth, and wed a woman whom I cannot love? They tell me she is young and fair, but I seek more than that in her who is to pass her life beside me. Youth and beauty fade, but a noble woman's love can never die. O oh, Irene, if thou couldst know how hard a thing it is to take thee, princess though thou art. Enter Ione. Ah, lady, thou hast mistaken thy way. Let me lead thee to the queen's apartments. Nay, my lord, I have come from her. She bid me say it was her will that I, her slave, should strive with my poor skill to while away the time till she could join thee. Thou a slave? By the gods, methought it was some high-born lady. Nay, even the princess Irene herself, seeking the queen, my mother. She was my mistress, and bestowed me as a gift upon the queen. 
This scroll is from her hand. May it please thee read it. Kneels and presents letter. Rise, fair maiden. I would rather listen to thy voice. May I ask thee to touch yon harp? I am weary, and a gentle strain will soothe my troubled spirit. Stay, let me place it for thee. Prince moves the harp and gazes upon Ione as she sings and plays. The wild birds sing in the orange groves, and brightly bloom the flowers. The fair earth smiles neath the summer sky through the joyous fleeting hours. But, oh, in the slave girl's lonely heart, sad thoughts and memories dwell and tears fall fast as she mournfully sings home dear home farewell though the chains they bind be all of flowers where no hidden thorn may be still the free heart sighs neath its fragrant bonds and pines for its liberty and sweet sad thoughts of the joy now gone in the slave girl's heart shall dwell as she mournfully sings to her sighing harp native land native land farewell tis a plaintive song is it thine own lot thou art mourning if so thou art a slave no longer nay my lord it was one my lady Irene loved, and thus I thought it would please thee. Then never sing it more. Speak not her name. Nay, forgive me if I pain thee. She was thy mistress, and thou didst love her. Was she kind to thee? By what name shall I call thee? Ione, your highness. Ah, yes, she was too kind. She never spake a cruel word, nor chid me for my many faults. Never can I love another as I loved my gentle mistress. And is she very fair? Has she no pride, no passion or disdain to mar her loveliness? She is a princess. Is she a true and tender woman, too? Though a princess, neath her royal robes there beats a warm true heart, faithful and fond, longing to be beloved and seeking to be worthy such great joy when it shall come. Thou asks me of her beauty. Painters place her face among their fairest works, and sculptors carve her form in marble. Yes, she is beautiful, but tis not that thou wouldst most care for. Couldst thou only know her? Pardon, but I think thou couldst not bear so cold a heart within thy breast as now. Ah, uh, do not cease, say on. There is that in the music of thy voice that soothes and comforts me. Come, sit beside me, fair Ione and I will tell thee why I do not love thy princess. You do forget, my lord, I am a slave. I will kneel here. Prince reclines upon a couch. Ione kneels beside him. Listen, from a boy I have been alone. No loving sister had I, no gentle friend, only cold counsellors or humble slaves. My mother was a queen, and mid the cares of state though fondly loving me, her only son, could find no time to win me from my lonely life. Thus, though dwelling neath a palace roof with every wish supplied, I longed most fondly for a friend, and now, ere long, a crown will rest upon my head, a nation bend before me as their king. And now, more earnestly than ever, do I seek one who can share with me the joys and cares of my high lot, a woman true and noble, to bless me with her love? And could not the Princess Irene be to thee all thou hast dreamed? I fear I cannot love her. They told me she was beautiful and high-born, and when I sought to learn yet more, t'was but to find she was a cold, proud woman, fit to be a queen, but not a loving wife. Thus I learn to dread the hour when I must wed. Yet tis my mother's will, my country's welfare calls for the sacrifice, and I must yield myself. They who told thee she was proud and cold do all speak falsely. 
Proud she is to those who bow before her, but to gain some honour for themselves, and cold to such as love her for her royalty alone. But if a fond and faithful heart, and a soul that finds its happiness in noble deeds can make a queen, Irene is worthy of the crown she will wear. And now, if it please thee, I will seek the garden, for thy mother bids me gather flowers for the feast. Adieu, my lord. She bows, her veil falls. Constantine hands it to her. Nay, kings should not bend to serve a slave, my lord. I do forget myself most strangely. There, take thy veil and leave me. Turns aside. Nay, forgive me if I seem unkind, but I cannot treat thee as a slave. Come, I will go with thee to the garden. Thou art too fair to wander unprotected and alone. Come, Ione. Leads her out. Curtain. Scene fourth. The gardens of the palace. Ione weaving a garland. The rose is love's own flower, and I will place it in the wreath I weave for thee, O Constantine. Would I could bring it to thy heart as easily. And yet, methinks, if all goes on as now, the slave Ione will ere long win a prince's love. He smiles when I approach, and sighs when I would leave him, listens to my songs, and saves the withered flowers I gave him days ago. How gentle and how kind! Ah, noble Constantine, thou little thinkest the slave thou art smiling on is the proud, cold Princess Irene, who will one day show thee what a fond, true wife she will be to thee. Sings. Enter Helen. Kneels to Ione. Helon, my father's friend, thou hear. A hush, betray me not, I am no princess now. Rise, I do beseech thee, kneel not to me. Dear lady, why this secrecy? What dost thou here, disguised, in the palace where thou art soon to reign a queen? Hark, is all still? Yes, none are nigh. Speak low, I'll tell thee all. Thou knowest the young prince loves me not. Oh, nay, do not sigh. I mean the princess, not the slave Ione, as I now call myself. Well, I learned this, and vowed to win the heart he could not give. And so in this slave's dress I journeyed hither with Rienzi the ambassador as a gift unto the queen. Thus, as a poor and nameless slave, I seek to win the noble Constantine to life and love. Dost understand my plot? And wilt thou aid me, Father Helon? Tis a strange thought. None but a woman would have planned it. Yes, my child, I will aid thee, and thou yet shall gain the happiness thy true heart well deserves. We will talk of this yet more anon. I came hither to see the prince. They told me he was pale and ill, in sorrow for his hated lot. Say, is this so? Ah, yes, most true, and I am cause of all this sorrow. Father, tell me, Cannot I by some great deed give back his health, and never have the grief of knowing that he suffered because I was his bride? How can I avert this fate? I will do all, bear all, if he may be saved. Grieve not, my child. He will live, and learn to love thee fondly. The cares of a kingdom are too much for one so young, but he would have happiness throughout his native land, and toiling for the good of others he hath hidden his sorrow in his own heart and pined for tenderness and love. Thou hast asked if thou could save him. There is one hope, if thou canst find a brave friend, that fears no danger when a good work leads him on. Listen, my daughter, in a deep and lonely glen, far beyond the palace gates, there grows an herb, whose magic power, tis said, brings new life and strength to those who wreathe it round their head in slumber. Yet none dare seek the spot, for spirits are said to haunt the glen, and not a slave in all the palace but grows pale at mention of the place, or I had been there long ere this. And now, my child, who canst thou send? I will send one who fears not spirit or demon, one who will gladly risk e'en life itself for the brave young prince. Blessed be the hand that gathers, thrice blessed be he who dares the dangers of the way. Bring hither him thou speakest of, I would see him. She stands before thee. Nay, start not, father. I will seek the dreaded glen, and gather there the magic flowers that may bring health to Constantine and happiness to me. I will away. Bless, and let me go. Thou, a woman delicate and fair? Nay, 
Nay, it must not be, my child. Better he should die than thou shouldst come to harm. I cannot let thee go. Thou canst not keep me now. Thou hast forgot I am a slave, and none may guess beneath this veil a princess is concealed. I will take my water-urn, and with the other slaves pass to the spring beyond the city gates, then glide unseen into the haunted glen. Now, tell me how looks the herb, that I may know it. Tis a small green plant that blossoms, only by the broad dark stream dashing among the rocks that fill the glen. But let me once again implore thee not to go. Ah, fatal hour when I first told thee, tis sending thee to thy death. Stay, stay, my child, or let me go with thee. It cannot be. Do thou remain, and if I come not back ere set of sun, do thou come forth to seek me. Tell Constantine I loved him, and so farewell. I return successful, or I return no more. Ione rushes out. Thou brave and noble one, to dare so much, for one who loves thee not. I'll go and pray the gods to watch above thee, and bring thee safely back. Exit, Helen. Curtain. Scene fifth. A terrace beside the palace. Enter Constantine. Why comes she not? I watched her slender form when with the other slaves she went forth to the fountain yonder. I knew her by the rosy veil and snow-white arm that bore the water urn. The morning sun shone brightly on the golden hair, and seemed more beautiful for resting there. And now tis nearly set, and yet she comes not. Why should I grieve because my mother's slave forgets me? Shame on thee, Constantine! How weak and childish I have grown! This fever gives no rest when Ione is not here to sing sweet songs and cheer the weary hours. Ah, she comes. Enter Ione with basket of flowers. Where hast thou been, Ione? The long day passed so slowly, and I miss thee sadly from my side. But thou art pale, thy locks are damp. What has chanced to thee? Speak, I beseech thee. Tis nothing. Calm thyself, my lord. I am well, and bring thee from the haunted glen the magic flowers whose power I trust will win thee health and happiness. May it please thee to accept them. Kneels and gives the flowers. Thou? Thou, Ione? Hast thou been to that fearful spot where mortal foot hath feared to tread? The gods be blessed thou art safe again. How can I thank thee? And why didst thou risk so much for my poor life? It were not worth the saving if thine were lost. My lord, a loving nation looks to thee for safety and protection. I am but a feeble woman, and none would grieve if I were gone. None weep for the friendless slave Ione. Oh, say not thus. Tears would be shed for thee, and one heart would grieve for her who risked so much for him. Speak not of death or separation, for I cannot let thee go. I will not leave thee yet till I have won thy lost health back. The old priest Helon bid me seek the herbs, and bind them in a garland for thy brow. If thou wilt place it there and rest a while, I am repaid. If thy hand gave it, were it deadly poison I would place it there. Now sing, Ione, thy low sweet voice will bring me pleasant dreams and the healing sleep will be the deeper with thy music sounding in mine ears. The prince reclines upon the terrace. Ione weaves a garland and sings. Flowers, sweet flowers, I charge thee well. O'er the brow where ye bloom, cast a healing spell. From the shadowy glen where spirits dwell, I have borne thee here, thy power to tell. Flowers, pale flowers, o'er the brow where ye lie, cast thy sweetest breath. Ere ye fade and die. Ione places the garland on the head of the prince who falls asleep. She sits beside him softly singing. Curtain. Scene sixth. The queen's apartment. The queen alone. 
"'Tis strange what power this slave hath gained o'er Constantine. "'She hath won him back to health again, "'and never have I seen so gay a smile upon his lips "'as when she stood beside him in the moonlight singing to her harp. "'And yet, though well and strong again, "'he takes no interest in his native land. "'He comes no more to council hall or feast, "'but wanders among his flowers with Ione. "'How can I rouse him to the danger that is near?' The Turkish sultan and his troops are on their way to conquer Greece, and he, my Constantine, who should be arming for the fight, sits weaving garlands with the lovely slave girl. Ah, a thought hath seized me. Why cannot she, who hath such power over him, rouse up with noble words the brave heart slumbering in his breast? I hear her light step in the hall. Ione, Ione, come hither. I would speak with thee. Enter Ione. Your pleasure, dearest lady. Ione, thou knowest how I love thee for the brave deeds thou hast done. Thou hast given health unto my son, hath won him back to happiness. Thou hast conquered his aversion to the princess, and he will gladly wed her when the hour shall come. Is it not so? Dear lady, that I cannot tell thee. He never breathes her name, and if I speak of her as thou hast bid me, he but sighs and grows more sad. And yet I trust— Nay, I well know that when he sees her he will gladly give his hand to one who loves him as the princess will. Then do not grieve, but tell thy slave how she may serve thee. O Ione, if thou couldst wake him from the quiet dream that seems to lie upon his heart, his country is in danger, and he should be here to counsel and command. Go tell him this in thine own gentle words. Rouse him to his duty, and thou shalt see how brave a heart is there. Thou hast a wondrous power to sadden or to cheer. Oh, use it well, and win me back, my noble Constantine. Canst thou do this, Ione? I will, and strive most earnestly to do thy bidding. But of what danger didst thou speak? No harm to him, I trust. The Turkish troops are now on their way, to carry woe and desolation into Greece, and he, the prince, hath taken no part in the councils. His nobles mourn at his strange indifference, and yet he heeds them not. I know not why, but some new happiness hath come to him, and all else is forgot. But time is passing. I will leave thee to thy work, and if thou art successful, thou wilt have won a queen's most fervent gratitude. Adieu, my child. Exit the queen. Yes, Constantine, thy brave heart shall awake, and when thy country is once safe again, I'll come to claim the love that now I feel is mine. Exit Ione. Curtain. Scene seventh. Apartment in the palace. Enter Ione with sword and banner. Now may the gods bless and watch above thee, Constantine. Give strength to thine arm, courage to thy heart, and victory for the cause for which thou wilt venture all. Ah, could I but go with thee, thy shield would then be useless. For with mine own breast would I shelter thee, and welcome there the arrows meant for thee. He comes. Now let me rouse him from this dream, and try my power o'er his heart. Enter Constantine. What high thought stirring in thy heart hath brought the clear light to thine eye, Ione, the bright glow to thy cheek? What mean these arms? Wouldst thou go forth to meet the Turks? Thy beauty would subdue them sooner than the sword thou art gazing on so earnestly. Thou hast bade me speak, my lord, and I obey. But pardon thy slave if in her wish to serve she seem too bold. Thy mother and thy subjects wonder at thy seeming indifference when enemies are nigh. Thine army waits for thee to lead them forth. Thy counsellors sit silent, for their prince is gone. While grief and terror reign around, he is wandering among his flowers, or listening to the music of his harp. Ah, oh, why is this? What hath befallen thee? Thou art no longer pale and feeble, and yet there seems a spell set on thee. Ah, oh, cast it off, and show them that thou hast no fear. I am no coward, Ione, but there is a spell upon me. Tis a holy one, and the chain that holds me here I cannot break, for it is love. I have lost the joy I once took in my subjects and my native land and I'm content to sit beside thee, and listen to the music of thy voice. Then let that voice arouse thee. Oh, fling away the chain that keeps thee from thy duty, and be again the noble prince who thought but of his people. 
Oh, let me plead for those who sorrow for thy care, and here let me implore thee to awaken from thy dream and be thyself again. She kneels. Oh, not to me. Rise, I beseech thee, rise. Thou hast led me to my duty. I will obey thee. I would have thee gird on thy sword, and with shield upon thine arm, and banner in thy hand, go forth and conquer like a king. Show those who doubt thee that their fears are false, that thou art worthy of their love. Lead forth thy troops, and save thy country from the woe that now draws nigh. Victory surely will be theirs when thou shalt lead them on. Give me my sword, unfurl my banner, and say farewell. I will return victorious, or no more. Thy voice hath roused me from my idle but most lovely dream, and thy brave words shall cheer me on till I have won the honour of my people back. Pity and forgive my fault, and ah, remember in thy prayers one who so passionately loves thee. Farewell, farewell. Kisses her robe and rushes out. Ione sinks down. Curtain. Scene eighth. On the battlements. Ione watching the battle. The battle rages fiercely at the city gates, and the messengers are fearful of defeat. I cannot rest while Constantine is in such peril. Let me watch here and pray for him. Ah, oh, I can see his white plume waving in the thickest of the fight, where the blows fall heaviest and the danger is most great. The gods guard him in this fearful hour. See how small the brave band grows. They falter and retreat. One blow now bravely struck may turn the tide of battle. It shall be done. I will arm the slaves now in the palace and lead them on to victory or death. We may win, and if not, I shall die in saving thee, Constantine. Ione rushes out. Curtain. Scene ninth. The castle terrace. Enter Constantine. The victory is ours, and Greece again is free, thanks to the gods, and to the brave unknown who led on my slaves, and saved us when all hope seemed gone. Who could have been the fearless stranger? Like an avenging spirit came the mysterious leader, carrying terror and destruction to the Turkish ranks. My brave troops rallied, and we won the day. Yet when I sought him, he was gone, and none could tell me where. He hath won my deepest gratitude, and the honour of all Greece for this brave deed. But where is Ione? Why comes she not to bid me welcome home? Ah, could she know that thoughts of her gave courage to my heart, and strength to my weak arm, and led me on that I might be more worthy her? Ah, yonder comes the stranger. He may not think to see me here. I will step aside. Constantine retires. Enter Ione in armor, bearing sword. The gods be thanked. The brave young prince hath conquered. From the flying Turk I won his banner back, and now my task is done. I must fling by this strange disguise and be myself again. I must bind up my wound and seek to rest, for I am faint and weary. Ah! Oh, what means this sudden dimness of mine eyes, this faintness? Can it be death? Oh, tis welcome. Constantine, it is for thee. Ione faints. Constantine rushes in. Ione, Ione, look up and listen to the blessings of my grateful heart for all thou hast dared and done for me. So pale, so still. Ah, must she die now I have learned to love so fervently and well? Ione, awake! Ione rouses. Pardon this weakness. I will retire, my lord. Ah, do not leave me till I have poured out my gratitude. My country owes its liberty to thee. Then let me hear before thee offer up my country's thanks, and tell thee what my heart hath striven to hide. Dear Ione, listen, I do beseech thee. Kneels. My lord, remember Lady Irene. Constantine, starting up. Why comes she thus between my happiness and me? Why did she send thee hither? Thou hast made the chain that binds her to me heavier to be borne, the sorrow of my heart more bitter still. Nay, do not weep. I will be calm. Thou art pale and faint, Ione. Lean thus on me. 
Nay, leave me, I cannot listen to thee. Go, I pray thee, go. Not till thou hast pardoned me. I have made thee weep, and every tear that falls reproaches me for my rash words. Forget them, and forgive me. Ask not forgiveness of thy slave, my lord. Tis I who have offended. And think not thus of Lady Irene, who in her distant home hath cherished tender thoughts of one whom all so honoured. Think of her grief when she shall find thee cold and careless, and shall learn that he who should most love and cherish deems her but a burden, and hates the wife whom he hath vowed to wed. Ah, think of this, and smile no more upon the slave who may not listen to her lord. Thou art right, Ione. I will obey thee and seek to hide my sorrow within my lonely breast. Teach me to love thy mistress as I ought, and I will sacrifice each selfish wish, and be more worthy thy forgiveness, and a little place within thy heart. Trust me, I will speak no more of my unhappy love, and will seek thee only when thine own voice bids me come. The sunlight of thy presence is my truest joy and banishment from thee the punishment my willful heart deserves. Rest here, Ione, and weep for me no more. I am happy if thou wilt but smile again. Farewell, and may the gods forever bless thee. Kisses her robe and rushes out. Curtain. Scene tenth. A gallery in the palace. Enter Ione with flowers. How desolate and dreary all hath grown! The garden, once so bright, hath lost its beauty now, for Constantine no longer walks beside me. The palace room seems sad and lonely, for his voice no longer echoes there, and the music of his harp is never heard. His pale face haunts me through all my waking hours, and his mournful eyes look on me in my dreams. But soon his sorrow shall cease, for nearer draws the day when Princess Irene comes to claim the heart so hardly won and will by constancy and love so faithfully reward. Hark! I hear a step. It is Rienzi. How shall I escape? My veil is in the garden. He knows me and will discover all. Stay, this curtain shall conceal me. Hides within the drapery. Enter Rienzi stealthily. How? Not here? I told the messenger to meet me in the gallery that leads from the garden. Curses on him. He hath delayed and were I discovered in this part of the palace, all might be betrayed. I'll wait, and if he comes not, I'll bear the message to the friends myself, and tell the bold conspirators we meet tonight near the haunted glen to lay yet farther plans. We must rid the kingdom of the prince who will be made ere long our king, for his bridal with the princess Irene draws more near. But ere the royal crown shall rest upon his brow, that head shall be laid low. The queen will soon follow her young son, and then we'll seize the kingdom and rule it as we will. Hark! Methought I heard a sound. I may be watched. I'll stay no longer, but seek the place myself. Steals out and disappears in the garden. Ione comes from her hiding place. Surely the gods have sent me to watch above thee, Constantine, and save thee from the danger that surrounds thee. I will haste to tell him all I have discovered. Yet no, Rienzi may escape, and I can charge none other with the crime. They meet near the haunted glen, and not a slave would follow even his brave prince to that dark spot. How can I aid him to discover those who seek to do him harm? Stay, I will go alone. Once have I dared the dangers of the way to save thy life, Constantine. Again I'll tread the fearful path, and watch the traitors at their evil work. It shall be done. I will dare all, and fail not, falter not, till thou who art dearer to me than life itself art safe again. Exit. Curtain. Scene eleventh. A wood near the haunted glen. Ione, shrouded in white, glides in and conceals herself among the trees. Enter Rienzi, looking fearfully about. Oh, tis a wild and lonely spot, and tis said strange spirits have been seen to wander here. Why come they not? Tis past the hour, and I, who stand undaunted when the fiercest battle rages around me, now tremble with strange fear in this dim spot. Shame on thee, Rienzi. There is naught to fear. Opens a scroll and reads. Here are their names. 
all pledged to see the deed accomplished. Tis a goodly list, and Constantine must fall when foes like these are round him. Ione appears within the glen. Ah, methought I heard a sound. Nay, twas my foolish fancy. Spirits, I defy thee. Beware, beware. Dear gods, what's that? It was a voice. Rushes wildly towards the glen, sees Ione, drops scroll and dagger. Tis a spirit. The gods preserve me. I will not stay. Exit in terror. Enter Ione. Saved! Saved! Here are the traitors' names, and here Rienzi's dagger to prove my story true. Now hence with all my speed, no time is to be lost. These to thee, Constantine, and joy unfailing to my own fond heart. Exit Ione. Curtain. Scene twelfth. Apartment in the palace. Enter Constantine. This little garland of pale withered flowers is all now left me of Ione. Faded like my own bright hopes, broken like my own sad heart. Yet still I cherish it, for her dear hand wove the wreath, and her soft eyes smiled above the flowers as she twined them from my brow. Those happy days are past. She comes no more, but leaves me sorrowing and alone. And yet tis better so. The princess comes to claim my hand, and then twill be a sin to watch Ione, to follow her unseen, and listen to her voice when least she thinks me near. The gods give me strength to bear my trial worthily, and suffer silently the great sorrow life can give, that of losing her. Leans sadly upon the harp. Enter Ione. My lord! He does not hear me. How bitter and how deep must be his grief, when the voice that most he loves falls thus unheeded on his ear. My lord! Constantine, starting. And thou art really here? Ah, oh, Ione, I have longed for thee most earnestly. Ah, oh, forgive me. In my joy I have disobeyed and told the happiness thy presence brings. What wouldst thou with me? My lord, I have strange tidings for thine ear. Oh, tell me not the princess Irene hath arrived. Nay, tis not that. I have learned the secret of a fearful plot against thy life. Rienzi and a band of other traitors seek to win thy throne and take the life of their kind prince. It cannot be, Ione. They could not raise their hands against one who hath striven for their good. They cannot wish the life I would so gladly have lain down to save them. Who told thee this, Ione? I cannot, no, I will not think they could prove so ungrateful unto their prince. I cannot doubt the truth of this, my lord, for one whose word I trust learned it, and followed to the haunted glen, there saw Rienzi, whose guilty conscience drove him from the place, leaving behind this scroll whereon all the traitors' names, and this dagger, tis his own as thou mayest see. Shows dagger and scroll. I can no longer doubt, but I had rather felt the dagger in my heart than such a wound as this. The names are few. I fear them not, and will ere long show them a king may pardon all save treachery like this. But tell the name of thy brave friend who hath discovered this deep treason, and let me offer some reward to one who hath watched above me with such faithful care. Nay, my lord, no gift, no thanks are needed. Tis a true and loving subject who is well rewarded if his king be safe. Thou canst not thus deceive me. It was thine own true heart that dared so much to save my life. O oh, Ione, why wilt thou make me love thee more by deeds like these? Why make the sorrow heavier to bear, the parting sadder still? Thou dost forget, my lord, I have but done my duty. May it please thee, listen to a message I bear thee from the queen. Say on. I will gladly listen to thy voice while yet I may. She bid me tell thee that to-morrow, ere the sun shall set, the princess Irene will be here. Constantine starts and turns aside. Forgive me that I pain thee, but I must obey. Yet farther, thy bride hath sent her statue as a gift to thee, and thou wilt find it in the queen's pavilion. She bid me say she prayed thee to go look upon it and remember there thy solemn vow. O oh, Ione, 
Could she send none but thee to tell me this? To hear it from thy lips but makes the tidings heavier to bear. Canst thou bid me go, and vow to love one whom I have learned to hate? Canst thou bid me leave thee for a fate like this? My lord, thou art soon to be a king. Then for thy country's sake remember thy hand is plighted to the princess, and let no kindly thoughts of a humble slave keep thy heart from its solemn duty. I am no king. Tis I who am the slave, and thou, Ione, are more to me than country, home, or friends. Nay, do not turn away. Think only of the love I bear thee, and listen to my prayer. I must not listen. Hast thou so soon forgot the vow thou made that no word of love should pass thy lips? Remember, tis a slave who stands before thee. Once more thou shalt listen to me, Ione, and then I will be still for ever. Thou shalt be my judge. Thy lips shall speak my fate. I cannot love the princess. Wouldst thou bid me vow to cherish her while my heart is wholly thine? Wouldst thou ask me to pass through life beside her with a false vow on my lips, and with words of love I do not feel? Conceal from her the grief of my divided heart? Must I give up all the bright dreams of a happier lot, and feel that life is but a bitter struggle, a ceaseless longing but for thee? Rather bid me to forget the princess, and bind with love sweet change the slave unto my side, my bride for ever. The slave, Ione, can never be thy bride, and thou art bound by solemn vows to wed the princess Irene. My duty and thine honour are more precious than a poor slave's love. Banish all thoughts of her, and prove thyself a faithful lord unto the wife who now comes trustingly to thee. Ask thine own heart if life could be a bitter pilgrimage, when a sacrifice like this had been so nobly made. A tender wife beside thee, a mother's blessing on thy head. Oh, were not this a happier fate than to enjoy a short, bright dream of love, but to awake and find thy heart's peace gone, thy happiness for ever fled, to see the eyes that once looked reverently upon thee now turned aside, and lips that spoke but tender words now whisper scornfully of broken vows thou wert not brave enough to keep. Forgive me, but I cannot see the prince so false to his own noble heart. Cast off this spell, forget me, and Irene shall win thee back to happiness. Never. All her loveliness can never banish the pure, undying love I bear to thee. Oh, Ione, canst thou doubt its truth, when I obey thee now, and prove how great thy power o'er my heart hath grown? Oh, let the sacrifice win from thee one gentle thought, one kind remembrance of him whose life thou hast made so beautiful for a short hour. And in my loneliness, sweet memories of thee shall cheer and gladden, and I will bear all for thy dear sake. And now farewell. Forgive if I have grieved thee, and at parting grant me one token to the silent love that henceforth must lie unseen within my heart. Farewell, Ione. He kisses her. Ione, falling at his feet. Ah, forgive me. Here let me seek thy pardon for the grief I have brought thee. May all the happiness that earth can bring be ever thine. But if all others should forsake thee, in thine hour of sorrow remember there is one true heart that cannot change— Oh, may the gods bless thee. Tis my last wish, last prayer. Farewell. Stay. I would claim from thee one little word which hath the power to brighten in my sorrow. I have never asked thee, for I thought my heart had read it in thine eyes that looked so kindly on me, and the lips that spoke such gentle words of hope. But, ah... Uh, Tell me now, at parting, dost thou love me, dear Ione? I do most fondly, truly love thee. Ione, thy voice has been a holy spell to win me to my duty. Thy love shall keep me pure and faithful till we meet above. Farewell. Farewell. And, oh, remember how I have loved thee, and may the memory of all I have borne for thee win thy pardon for any wrong I may have done thee. The princess will repay the grief the slave hath caused thy noble heart. Remember Ione, and be true. Exit. Gone, gone, 
now lost to me forever. Remember thee. Ah, how can I ever banish thy dear image from this heart that now hath grown so desolate? I will be true. None shall ever know how hard a struggle hath been mine, that I might still be worthy thee. Yes, Irene, I will strive to love thee, and may the gods give me strength. But Ione, Ione, how can I give thee up? Picks up a flower Ione has dropped, and puts it in his bosom and goes sadly out. Curtain Scene thirteenth The Queen's Pavilion a dark curtain hangs before an alcove. Enter Constantine. The hour hath come when I shall gaze upon the form of her who hath cast so dark a shadow o'er my life, beautiful and young, and blessed with all that makes her worthy to be loved. And yet I fear I have not taught my willful heart the tenderness I ought. I fear to draw aside the veil that hides her from me for I cannot banish the sweet image that forever floats before mine eyes. I only soft gazes on me, and the lips are whispering, I love thee, but I have promised to be true. No thoughts of her must lead me now astray. My fate is here. Approaches the curtain. Let me gaze upon it, and think gently of the wife so soon to be mine own. Why do I fear? Courage, my heart. He draws aside the curtain, and Ione, veiled, appears as a statue upon its pedestal. Another veil to raise. How hard the simple deed hath grown. One last sweet thought of thee, Ione, and then I will no longer falter. He turns away and bows his head. Constantine. He starts and gazes in wonder as the statue, Casting aside the veil, comes down and kneels. Here at thy feet kneels thy hated bride, the proud, cold princess, asking thee to pardon all the sorrow she hath given thee. Ah, smile upon me, and forget Ione, who as a slave hath won thy love, but as the princess will repay it. Forgive and love me still. Thou, thou, Irene, she whom I so feared to look upon, Ah, no, thou art Ione, the gentle slave. Say I am dreaming. Why art thou here to make another parting the harder to be born? Fling by thy crown and be Ione again. Irene, rising. Listen, Constantine, and I will tell thee all. I am Irene. In my distant home I learned thou didst not love me, and I vowed to win thy heart before I claimed it. Thus unknown the proud princess served thee as a slave, and I learned to love thee with a woman's fondest faith. I watched above thee that no harm should fall, I cheered and gladdened life for thee, and won the heart I longed for. I knew the sorrow thou wouldst feel, but tried thy faith by asking thee to sacrifice thy love and keep thine honour stainless. Here let me offer up a woman's fondest trust and most undying love. Wilt thou believe and pardon mine offence? Kneels again before him. Not at my feet, Irene. Tis I who should bend low before thee, asking thy forgiveness. For all thou hast dared for me, for every fearless deed, for every loving thought, all I can lay before thee is a fond and faithful heart, whose reverence and love can never die but through the pilgrimage of life shall be as true and tender as when I gave it to the slave Ione. Embraces Irene. Tableau. Curtain. End of Section 5. The Greek Slave.